Jesus' name. Amen. If you would remain standing for this morning's scripture reading, I'll be reading out of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will, will, will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture come, comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning. Good morning. If you need some seats, the front row is always open. <laughs> Uh, this morning, uh, let's see here. Could I get some help with this, Jeremy, on the this tablet? Thank you. Uh, this morning, we are in Second Peter. And if you are visiting here this morning, then welcome to Regeneration Church. My name is Matt. We are going through this book of Second Peter, which is really a letter. Really interesting that uh, when we read letters in the Bible, we're reading, thank you, we're reading someone else's mail. But this is also for us because Peter writes to Christians that are scattered all over the place. So if you are joining us for the first time online or here in person, uh, open up to 2 Peter and we are going to dig into scripture. I'm going to pray and then uh, we're going to ask God to help us to understand his word. So let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for meeting us here. God, I want to pray for people that... Um, Maybe this is new to them, maybe they've never really read the Bible, or maybe they um, have ventured into this, uh, this community, this church, whether in person or online. And God, we, um, we ask that you would help us to understand your word. We pray that our hearts would be open. God, just that open mind, that open heart to what it is that you desire to speak to us. And God, sometimes we know that there are things that we need answers for, we're struggling with, and yet, Lord, there are times that you want to speak to us about something else. So help us to be open to both of those things. We, um, we, we ask that you would bless those that are um, just struggling in their own faith, that you would give assurance of your reality, of who you are, that you are real. So God, today we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, the title of the message is Three Assurances of God's Reality. Three Assurances of God's Reality. A couple of things before we dig into our text in 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, the last two Wednesdays, we've done something called Learning Labs. Learning Labs are a little bit different than just a, a Bible study that we would have or a sermon. Uh, there's question and answer. We do a deep dive. It takes longer. We have a, a break in between. Those are online. And we've been going over God's good and beautiful design for sexuality. And I, I think that in a world that is filled with confusion, uh, we need clarity. Uh, we, we look at God's word. We see that God has a good and beautiful design. And and um, it's full of grace and truth. So there's part one and part two. I would recommend that you listen to part one first because that lays a foundation rather than responding to all the cultural things that are out there. And then listen to part two secondly because then it starts to address more of the current culture and um, looking at God's word. So that is available for you online. As we are considering First uh, Peter, and I mean going into Second Peter, remember First Peter, Peter wrote, 
And beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. In other words, this is a strange life that God has given to us where we live in a world that is so polarized, it is so diverse, it's so different, it's a pluralistic society. Um, and yet God writes to us through Peter, uh, Peter being inspired by the Holy Spirit, that we would have a reason for the hope that is within us. Um, now in Second Peter, what we see is that Peter is writing to remind Christians who are scattered throughout Asia Minor, both Jews and Gentiles. So how many of you are either a Jew or a Gentile? Raise your hand. Okay, so Jews are, a Gentile is a non-Jewish person, a Jew is a Jewish person, so he's writing to all of us. He's writing to Christians, scattered all over the place, going through difficult times. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy doing at times is to read fiction. I, I find that, um, I, I love nonfiction. Fiction just takes me out into a different world. I'm reading a book right now that was written like around 2012 uh, by a military leader, uh, I can't remember which branch of the military he was in. It's fascinating to me because I love dystopian type of novels. Um, and it's about what would happen if we got hit with an EMP, electric magnetic pulse. Uh, it knocks out everything computerized, everything like, and how quickly our world devolves into selfishness and, and fighting. And I don't know if the guy who wrote it is a Christian or not, but it's really um, intriguing to me that he includes characters in this novel that are from the same church and how they respond to one another. And all of a sudden, one person has all this food and another person doesn't. And uh, the person that has all the food doesn't want to share. And the person says, hey, you know what? My kids, they're start like, this is going on. And uh, the guy pulls out a shotgun. He's like, hey, get off my property. And he's like, we're in the same, we sing in the choir together. And, and like, I'm reading this going like, oh man, this is so crazy. And then I had to recheck when that was written, 2012. I was like, was this written in 2020? Like, I, I feel like it's written in 2020. I think Peter is writing to give us assurance of God's reality to help Christians continue to be faithful in hard times. When Peter wrote his first letter, I don't think he had in mind that this is part one and then I'm going to write a part two. I think what happens is things start to get worse. There's a guy named Nero who is uh, in charge, and Nero is persecuting Christians. But then another thing is that Peter knows that his time of departure is coming. Peter's going to die soon. And so wanting to leave them a reminder, he wants them to be faithful, and he pens this second letter to reassure Christians who are about to face even harder times. And I, I hate to say it, but in some ways, when I, I think about our world, I go, man, I, I think that we have to be ready for harder times. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom, but I'm just trying to say that things can get a lot worse than they are right now. Because sometimes we go, well, things are bad, but they're not as bad for us today as they were for Peter as he's writing to Christians who are scattered throughout Asia Minor when Caesar Nero is lighting them on fire and saying, look at the light of the world. So I have a feeling that when Peter is writing, he has these things in mind. But sometimes it's really hard to have this assurance of God's reality when we're struggling. Sometimes it's hard to have God's, uh, an assurance of God's reality when we ourselves are going through trials, when, when there's relational conflict, when it seems like there's health things, there's financial things, there's political things. And uh, sometimes it, even Christians go crazy and you're going like, why is that Christian going nuts? Like, why are they acting the way that they're acting? And I think that Peter is writing, and it grounds us in some of these realities that I believe will help us today. This morning, after our time of prayer, um, our 9 a.m. prayer, um, I asked Eric, Eric, could you just belt out blessed assurance? And I knew on the spot he would just be able to, to jump in. And if you know this hymn, hymns are incredible because they're so deep theologically. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. You know, I think about these uh, things that were written by uh, different people in times past. And Fanny Crosby um, lived to age 95. She, she lived from like just around the Civil War era into the time of Billy Graham. So can you imagine that, like being born like right around the Civil War time and then going into Billy Graham's time? 
um, she wrote so many hymns, and one of the quotes, uh, by the way, she went blind when she was four years old. Um, she, she was very small. Um, I believe her mom died at a very young age. Um, she saw slavery. She was a part of the abolitionist movement. Um, eventually, uh, she even wrote hymns about uh, abolition and about um, you know, God creating us in his image. One of her quotes was, blindness was the greatest blessing the creator ever bestowed on me. And so I think about when we go through hard times and we struggle, sometimes we take our trials and we look at God through the filter of our struggle. And whatever that struggle is, we go, God must love me or not love me based on how I'm doing. It's almost like the harder the times are, the more that in modern current world, assurances of God's reality start to fade in people's minds as though God never created us to struggle or to have trials or to suffer. But I think Fanny Crosby has these things in her life that we are going to look at this morning in Second Peter, these things that are so important for our assurance that God is real. Now, there's many assurances of God's reality, but just three that we are going to look at are the people that God speaks through, the experiences that we encounter, and the more sure prophecy of Scripture. So we're going to look at the people that God speaks through, the experiences we encounter, and the more sure prophecy of Scripture. Then we're going to look at freely you receive, freely you give. And I want to begin by the people that God speaks through. Who are the people in your life that God has maybe spoken to you through? Maybe you're not really a follower of Jesus yet, but there are people in your life that are hints that maybe God is real because of these people that are in my life. Could be friends, it could be relatives or a teacher, someone that you know. If you remember last week when Eric was teaching in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, uh, I'm reading from the New King James right now. It says, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these things, these qualities, you'll never fail. So in this way, there will be... Um, richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter is going into this reminder to confirm your calling. Make sure of your calling. Remember your calling. Remember your election. Remember who you are. When things go crazy, remember who you are. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember your identity. Because in the novel that I'm reading and in real life, I see when things go crazy, sometimes Christians forget who they are. And sometimes you just gotta be reminded of who you are in Christ. And so Peter writes, for this reason in verse 12, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. So Peter says, I'm not gonna ne be negligent. It's not gonna be because I didn't remind you. Um, my mom was the best reminder in the world. She, she probably is in the Guinness Book of World Record for the world's greatest reminder. And she would remind me of things all the time. And I hated it growing up. I hated it in my teenage years. I hated it in my 20s. In my 30s, I started appreciating it a little bit more. In my 40s, I loved it. And now I wish that she was still here to remind me. So the older that we get, the more that we need these reminders. Um, and, and when we're young as well. But when we're young, sometimes we don't really appreciate the reminders as much. So these reminders that Peter is writing, he's not, he says, I'm, I'm not going to be negligent. You know these things. You're established in the present truth. That is the same word, uh, established or strengthened, when Jesus told Peter, Peter, you're going to betray me. But when you return again, establish or strengthen your brethren. So isn't it cool? This is what Peter's doing. Peter's doing the very thing that Jesus says, you're going to betray me, but when you come back, establish your brethren. And he's like, I'm going to do that, Jesus. I will establish, I will strengthen my brethren. Um, in the present truth. So these are past things, but it's also present truth. And isn't it awesome that this book called the Bible 
that we have and we go, oh, it's such an ancient book. It has ancient truth, but it is true today. It has current truths for us right now. In every culture and in every place, it is relevant. And he says, yes, I think it right, as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. Peter not only wants to remind them, but to stir them up. You want to stir someone up. Sometimes you got to remind someone. Um, my, my best friend from childhood, his name is Javier, I, um, I got away for a couple of days uh, to a, a monastery in Big Sur um, on Friday and Saturday. It's a silent retreat. It, it wasn't long enough. I, it was beautiful, just silent, just quiet. Um, on my way back, I had this drive because Highway 1 to Big Sur is closed still. So it's not a two and a half hour drive, it's a four and a half hour drive. You have to go down 101, hit Highway 1, come up Cambria and go north again on Highway 1. So on the way back, I'm driving and I, I call, I use drive times to talk to some of my best friends to try to stay in touch. And I, I called my best friend from childhood, Javier, we've known each other since we were three and four and we just prayed for each other. We just started catching up on life and what's going on in our families and what's going on in our ministries. He's a pastor in, in Utah as well. And I, I remember when Javier was playing football, he went to Baldwin Park High School. I went to West Covina High School and I went to one of his games and uh, he, he was a really good football player, played at APU, played at Chico State, but he was having a bad game. And I was on the sidelines. I snuck down there and uh, the quarterback overthrew him and he was a wide receiver and uh, I just yelled to him because I could tell he was super bummed at himself. And I yelled, Javier! And he looks over at me. And I go, who do we play for? <laughs> and he looks at me. And man, there's still, I mean, I got choked up. Here's my best friend. And he looks and he's running back and he turns around and he goes, we play for Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. You know, I was just like blown away. I wanted to remind him that in that game, as intense as it was, to remind him of something that stirred him up. And all of a sudden, you could see this fire come back. You know, he's down on himself. He's bummed out, but he's not playing for accolades. He's not playing for his own glory. He's playing for Christ. And so all of a sudden, it stirs him up. And, and Peter's wanting to stir up Christians that are going through really hard times because there's this guy named Nero that says, it's okay to kill Christians. And he says, I want to stir you up by reminding you of who you are. And this morning, I hope and pray that this is what happens when we read these words, that it stirs us up by way of reminder, not just a reminder that's a nagging reminder. That's how I used to think of reminders. It's just a nag. It's just like my mom telling me, Matt, you know, brush your teeth, you know, wash your face, and like more things that were deeper as I became a, a father, the thing that she would always tell me is, Matthew, she'd call me. It doesn't matter what's going on. I mean, she's down in Southern California. She doesn't, she doesn't know what's going on, but she knows me. And she would always say, Matthew, be calm. <laughs> and when she would say that, it had the opposite effect. I would get all like, what do you mean be calm? I don't want to be calm. Like, Matthew, calm down. Be patient. And she would say patient as though it was like a five-second word. Be patient. And the more, I'm like, ah. Oh. And man, I hear her voice so often today when I'm not patient. Ah, I just got to breathe. <sighs> Calm down. Be patient. Stir up by way of reminder. Because Peter says this, knowing shortly I must put off this tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Do you remember the book of John? Do you remember Jesus telling Peter, hey, right now you go where you wanna go, but there's gonna be a day when you're older and people are gonna lead you around in speaking of the way that Peter was going to die. Peter, is a, he becomes a martyr. He gets uh, crucified upside down because he doesn't feel like he's worthy to be crucified the same way as Jesus. And Peter knows, I'm gonna put off this tent, this tent, how many of you are campers? Do you like camping in tents? How many of you think people that go camping are crazy to pay to sleep outside, all right? Like, that's ridiculous, right? Uh, we have some good friends that Deanna and I, when we take them uh, different places, we, we stayed at a, a condo one time in Lake Tahoe, and they thanked us for taking them camping with them. Like, that was, that was camping. Um, I know shortly I must put off my tent, See, the thing about a tent, uh, when, when we did our, our camping trip, our church camping trip to Bass Lake, 
Man, I was looking at the Donato's tent. Yeah, I had tent envy. I was looking at uh, the Rapola's tent. And, th- and these tents are like, man, they have like sh- outdoor showers and they must have like a sink in there and, and like a stove. But I'll tell you, it is still a tent. And when you're done camping, you're excited because you put your tent away. You fold it up. If you're uh, obsessive compulsive like I am, you brush it off, you clean it, you wrap it up, then you store it until the next time you need that tent. But the tent is temporary because as great as your tent is, you can't wait to get home into your own bed. It just, oh, clean bed, shower, I'm in my own place. Peter's saying, hey, uh, this body that we have is a tent. And some of us have pretty nice tents, and some of us have messed up tents, right? Like, some, some of us have tents that are just like holes in it, and it's like ripping, it's falling apart. Um, see, the thing about a tent is we need to be balanced as Christians. Uh, our bodies are important. Our bodies are this temple of the Holy Spirit, um, Our bodies mean something. God created us. Uh, It says in Genesis, male and female, he created them in his own image. So that tent is important, but it is not all important. In the resurrection, we're going to get these better tents that are permanent tents, these permanent dwellings. Our bodies will be renewed. But until that time, we have to be careful not to swing that balance to one side or the other. One side, our bodies don't matter at all. And that's why it, it... devastates me to see the current culture that is telling even children, you could just change your sex to whatever you want to be. It's just a a tent. It doesn't matter. It's just an external thing. And whatever you want, you could just change that. What also bums me out is when we make the tent all important And it's like, we're not thinking about eternity and we're not thinking about spiritual things. And the most important thing is the comfort of my tent. And so in that balance, we see our tent is a a temporary tent that is going to be put off. Um, In verse 15, he says, moreover, I will be careful to ensure you that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Peter's saying, I'm gonna go away, but I will leave you a reminder. I almost did this this morning. I have a a suitcase. It's a small suitcase, but it's a suitcase nevertheless. I almost brought the suitcase with me. The suitcase is my treasure. It's my mom's letters. My mom would write every single week a handwritten letter. And then she would have a PS and then she would have, uh, you know, instructions and different things for each one of my kids and for Deanna and all of us. These reminders, I still have them. And I think it's one of the beautiful things about handwritten notes. How often do you still get a handwritten letter? It's like very, very rarely. And, and with email, it's so easy just to delete and it's out of sight, out of mind. And even though an email is a permanent storage somewhat and we still have it and we could recall it and search for it, I find that things that are physical and tangible, like photographs that you actually hold and, and they're up on your wall or you have them in your hand or letters are more... Um, they, they're better reminders for me today than digital memories that only pop up on your phone once in a while or emails and letters that you have to call up because you're intentionally looking for them. Peter says, hey, I'm gonna leave you a, a letter by way of reminder because I'm going away, but you're still gonna be reading this and we're reading it even today. And so this first assurance that we have of the reality of God is the people that God uses in our lives. Now, how do you impact others? What is a way that God could use you to impact other people? I think about the words that we speak. The words that we speak. Um, Sadly, we sometimes say words that we regret, and, and often as human beings, we hold on to those words. You know, they say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me that is a lie. The words hurt way more than a stick because the words are replayed over and over things that I said or things that were said to me. So we have to be very careful with our words. And by the way, if you're going through this thing of replaying negative words, stop. (laughs) Stop replaying the negative words. They're real. They happened. But imagine like your worst song that you hate And imagine it being just stuck on repeat over and over and over again 
and we do that. We, we could, the songs that we hate, we memorize them. Don't you, don't you know songs that you hate, the tune, and you could sing it, you even know the lyrics of them? But you don't have to keep playing them. And so what we should play is the reminders of the good things. And so people that have encouraged you, and we could do the same thing, is choose our words and pray, God, use these words and help these words to be a reminder of your reality. Secondly, we impact other people's lives, show them the reality of God by the actions we convey, the words we speak and the actions we convey. And therefore, we should be kind. Kindness is a quality and a characteristic that gets diminished in our current culture. Our current culture is like, oh, who cares if they're kind? Like, you know, it's almost like politicians. You ever hear politicians, they don't care about kindness. They just care about like destroying the other person. Kindness is something that um, as one of the, the fruits of God's spirit in us, one of the ways that God is described, it brings us to repentance. It's his goodness and kindness that brings us to repentance. Sometimes it's your kindness that will have an impact in someone else's life. And then we also impact others. We um, show the assurance of God's reality with the writings that we leave behind. Be thoughtful with your writings. One of the things that I did when I was away is I started writing letters. Uh, Deanna, you haven't gotten yours yet. I have a letter that I wrote to Deanna. I have a, a letter that I wrote to one of my kids. And so those letters, I mean, people could either read them or not read them. They could burn them or they could treasure them. Peter's letter thankfully was treasured by the church because we still have it. And then we also impact others by the prayers that we pray. So the words we speak, be open. The actions we convey, be kind. The writings we leave behind, be thoughtful. And the prayers we pray, be fervent. Be fervent in your prayers. Pray always, pray without ceasing. Pray for people that you love. The fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. So we, um, our righteousness is in Christ and we pray. Now, another assurance of God's reality is the experiences that we encounter. How many of you can say that you have had an experience with God, a personal experience with God? There's something that has happened in your heart, in your life. You sense God's presence. Uh, you sense his love. You sense his closeness. It's a personal experience, the experiences that we encounter. Peter had this incredible encounter. He says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey, when we're telling you about God's power and Jesus coming back, we're, we're not just making this up. This is not a fable. So in our world today that is so quick to be materialistic and materialism where it's only what you could see, what you could feel, what you could touch is real. Um, Peter's saying these things are not devised fables. We saw it. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Um, when he explains it, he goes on to say in verses 17 and 18, and we could read about this in Matthew and we could read about this in Luke for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Both at Jesus' baptism and on the Mount of Transfiguration, um, there is this audible voice. And Peter, James, and John are there on the Mount of Transfiguration. They hear this voice this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How many of you are parents? If you're a parent? Grandparents, how many grandparents? Okay, if you're a parent or grandparent. We would learn well from God the Father how to be a good parent. One of the things that we see in this, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want you to notice that when the Father gives this audible um, affirmation to Jesus. It's not just for Jesus. It's for the people that are around Jesus. Um, encourage and affirm your kids and grandkids around other people. Do it in private, but do it around other people also because there's something that happens in their hearts when you affirm them in the presence of others. Then notice what he said. This is my beloved son. You belong to me. You're mine. You're a part of me. And, and you have this beautiful gift of family that God has given to us, even though we have brokenness in our families, 
even though maybe you didn't or don't have the best relationship with your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or grandchildren or children. It's a gift. This is my beloved son. Also, I love you. So you belong to me and I love you. My beloved son, not just my son. And then in whom I am well pleased, I'm proud of you. Man, if a kid could hear those things, you belong to me, I love you, and, and I'm proud of you, it goes a long way in that relationship. And even if you didn't do a good job of doing that in the past, it's never too late to begin today. We don't have control over our past, but what we could do is we could do something today. It says, when we heard this voice which came from heaven, we were with him on the holy mountain. And Peter is saying, we experienced this. Sometimes, though, the difficult thing is that you experience God and you try to convey the experience to others and they're like, that's just a fable. Oh, that's just in your mind. That really didn't happen. But when you know them and you have time and they see your life and there's some credibility to your life, it becomes an assurance of God's reality even if they haven't yet experienced God. And maybe today you're going, well, I had an experience with God, but I don't experience him anymore. I had this experience of God's reality, but I don't feel him anymore. I don't think that he is still listening, or I used to think when I was a kid that he was there, but now I don't think he's there, because like I don't, I don't sense his presence. Well, thankfully, we don't just have other people in our lives to encourage us or our personal experiences of God's uh, assurances of God's reality, but we have the sure prophecy of Scripture the sure prophecy of scripture. In verse 19, it says, and so we have the more sure prophetic word. I love that. I love it in the New King James. That's why I chose it to to use these scriptures. We have the more sure prophetic word. You know what it's more sure than? It's more sure than my experience. Now, my experience is valid because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, Um, The Holy Spirit is given as a guarantee, so we sense God's presence. But sometimes our feelings will betray us. Sometimes feelings are real. Feel your feelings. Don't stuff them. Uh, The Psalms, by the way, if you don't know how to express your feelings, uh, read through the Psalms and pray those prayers because they help us to express things that we cannot express. And sometimes I'm reading the Psalms and I'm like, "I, I, I couldn't put that into words, but I just read that and that's where I feel right now. Feel your feelings, bring those things to God. But can you always trust your feelings? Um, there is uh, Adventures in Odyssey. Any of you ever play those adventures? So we'd go on vacations, and uh, this is before stinking smartphones. Uh, we would have these CDs, and we would put them in our CD player in our Suburban, and we're driving. And we'd go on these long family vacations, and it would be Adventures in Odyssey. And our kids are listening and it's getting their imaginations and the stories they get in there. And there's this one, I can't remember the title of it, but it's trust your heart, Will. And it's this kid that always trusts his heart. But then his heart wants to steal something from another kid. And then his heart wants to lie. And we cannot always trust our hearts. And so when they say, hey, follow your heart, I'm like, yeah. Some, you got to be careful because Jesus said out of the heart come adulteries and like all these evil thoughts and thefts and these other things. We have a more sure prophetic word. We have God's word. He says, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. In the midst of darkness, go for the light. When your life is dark, when circumstances are dark, when Peter is writing to people that are persecuted, If things get worse than they are today, go to the light. And it's the light of God's word. It shines in a dark place. Until when? Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Continue to meditate and read and listen to God's word until light begins to dawn in your heart. And until our hearts are reality when Christ comes back. And until that time, we have the light of God's prophetic word. If you are not a reader, or even if you are, uh, this is a dwell certificate that I will give to you, which is worth about 40 bucks for a year's subscription. So if you don't have one and you're new to the church, or you've been here for a while and you're like, hey, I don't have one of those, then talk to me after the service. Um, 
like, don't just say, hey, can I have the thing? Like, talk to me. Like, I want to get to know you. And then I'll give you the, the certificate after. Um, Heed as a light that shines until the dawn, uh, day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, we don't have time to go through these prophecies because there are over 300 prophecies of the Old Testament that Jesus fulfills in his lifetime. The 66 different books that make up our Bible, uh, written over a span of 1,500 years um, by over 40 different authors in three different languages on, on different continents about hundreds of controversial issues in total harmony, these older books predict things of these authors that never met one another and they're found in different places that are fulfilled in the life of Christ. I'm just gonna go through a couple of them. One is Genesis chapter 22. Um, that through Abraham's offspring, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. You could see this in Matthew chapter one, in Luke chapter three. Uh, Jesus, in his genealogy, he's a descendant of Abraham. If you read Genesis chapter 22, um, God told him that, uh, that he would bless him and it would be through Isaac. Isaac is the promised child. And then God does this really interesting thing. He tells Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love up to the mountain that I'll tell you and offer him there to me as a sacrifice. Now, I know that sounds like, oh my goodness, if, you're, if you've never read the Bible, you're like, I gotta run out of this place. This is crazy. Like human sacrifice, what's going on? Um, God tests Abraham's heart and Abraham believes that God is even able to raise Isaac from the dead if this is what God is doing. And when he takes him up to Mount Moriah, Isaac is old enough to march up that mountain to carry wood on his back up a hill to question and to look at his father Abraham and say, here's the wood, here's the fire, but where is the, the, the ram for the burnt offering? And, and Abraham says, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. God will provide himself. I've been to this mountain. I've been to Israel um, with our tour guide coming up over the hill that Abraham would have gone to in his travels and then seeing the mountain where Mount Moriah is afar off, which is the same mountain range also where Golgotha and Mount Calvary are, that Jesus offered his life for us that carried the wood on his back and it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And you just do an overlay of where the Old Testament geography and the New Testament geography and you're like, on the mountain of God it will be provided. Prophecy, it's amazing. From the book of Genesis to the gospels. Not only that, but you get to Isaiah, uh, one of the famous prophecies of Jesus that we read around Christmas time. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, prophesied in about 740 BC. And then you get to the gospels of Matthew and Luke and it says, while he thought about these things, uh, this is Joseph, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took to him his wife and did not know her um, till he had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So we have descendant of Abraham, we have born of a virgin, but we also have where he would be born. In Micah 5.2, but you Bethlehem Ephathra, um, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So this is incredible because you think it's also a prediction of where he would be born. Like, how can you do that? How can you do that? Like, uh, try to predict 
hundreds of years from now, where the president of the United States, if the United States is around at that point in time, where that president would be born. Like you can't, you can't predict these things, but also the timing of it. In Daniel chapter nine, if you want to go into depth in this one, go back on our website or on our YouTube page and you could find our teachings through Daniel. In 2020, we went through uh, Daniel, maybe it's 2021. Um, and this prophecy from Daniel, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. These are periods of seven the street shall be built again in the wall or the moat, even in troublesome times. And what we see is that even to the day that when Jesus comes in on the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, that this is something that we could see is predicted. And, and, and go, wow, when you look at the calendar and how the calendar is laid out, incredible that, that you go 483 years from the decree to rebuild the walls to Jesus coming in, riding in, so in the book of Luke, Jesus says, if you had known this your day, even this your day to Jerusalem, like if you would only recognize this. So what are the odds, right? What are the odds? What are the odds of winning the lottery? Well, the odds of winning the lottery are one in 259 million, if 259 million people are playing at that point in time. But the odds of a man fulfilling eight prophecies Eight, just eight prophecies are one in 10 to the 17th power. And Jesus fulfilled over 300. So there's a mathematician that said, okay, let's look at all these mathematical statistics and went through it. You could do it on your own, but it is amazing. So we have this sure word of prophecy. In fact, um, there's some friends of ours who's, uh, daughter was really struggling with, with her faith. She said, I don't believe anymore. I think that those are just myths. I think these things are just... And, and what this couple said to their daughter, she was already an adult and she was raised, you know, in, in the church and uh, she was just struggling. And um, they said to her, what about prophecy? What do you do with prophecy? And she said, because she knew, because she had been taught from the time she was young. She understood how our Bible was, was written and the times. And she said, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. And now she's walking with the Lord again today. And one of the things that brought her back was realizing, I, I can't deny prophecy. I can't deny these things being true. And I, I can't explain it. So we have this sure word of prophecy. Yes, there are people that, that influence us and show us God's reality. Yes, there are personal experiences. And I say, I, re I sense God's presence in my life. I experience God's love. But then we have the more sure word of prophecy, of scripture, because scripture supersedes even my own feelings when my feelings betray me. So knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Now this has a, a multiple meanings. One of them is that no prophecy is just one person saying, you gotta believe me. This prophecy comes from God. Well, if this prophecy comes from God, then it's gonna be fulfilled in many different ways and through the scriptures. Um, it, is, it is why when I took a field trip when I was in college, my, one of my professors at Azusa Pacific, he got his master's from BYU. And he took us back there. He, he studied Mormonism. And we went and we took a tour of the temple where at the, you couldn't go in the temple, but you could take a tour on the outside of the temple. And one of the things is they have a, a replica, which you can't touch, as this holy book, um, which we call the Book of Mormon today, that was given to Joseph Smith by the angel Moroni. But when you look at it, it's opened up to these pages and you, you, you just read it and you go, it doesn't make any sense because it's written in what what uh, Joseph Smith said was the heavenly language that no one else can interpret. Only Joseph Smith can interpret it. When I read my Bible, I could open it up and someone that reads Hebrew can go, well, you have an English Bible, let me go to the Hebrew Bible. I could open it up in the New Testament, someone can say, oh, well, let me read it in Greek in the original manuscripts. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. And not only that, if someone ever comes to you to say, 
I know all of these people in the past have, have interpreted the Bible this way, but they all missed it because God revealed to me what it really means. Either, either love that person and try to convince them or run for the hills <laughs> because no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of, of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved or carried, about, or carried along by the Holy Spirit. And, and one of the things that I love is that the Holy Spirit inspires writers in their own personality that still comes from their own personality, but the thoughts come from God. So Peter's writings are different than Paul's writings. In fact, later on, Peter's gonna say, yeah, Paul's writings, there are some of them that are difficult to understand. Uh, there's a different style. There's a different personality. So I wanna close with this. What if you have been... Re- um, assured of God's reality. And in that assurance, you've been assured by people who have impacted your life. You've been uh, assured of God's reality by personal experiences. And you've been assured of God's reality by the sure word of prophecy and of scripture. Let me read this to you out of Matthew chapter 10. Jesus, it says the, the 12 Jesus sent out, he commanded them. This is, this is what we could do. If you personally have been assured by God's presence in your life, personal experience, by other people and by God's word, do what Jesus sent the 12 out. He said, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter the city of the Samaritans. Now, this is before the book of Acts where the gospel is opened up to everyone and they're all to go. Jesus also reached out to Gentiles, but their official mandate to go and reach the Gentiles comes in the, in the book of Acts. But he tells them, first of all, go not to the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So who are those people to the apostles? Brothers and sisters, friends, neighbors, co- people that they know. So if you've been assured of God's reality, go to people that you know in your life. And maybe they don't really follow Christ or maybe they have doubts, but go to them. And what do you do? Jesus said, as you go, so you go. And as you go, preach. So use words. Remember, I think it was St. Francis of Assisi that said, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. And Jesus says here, go and use words. Uh, Preach. Saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let me explain to you the kingdom of heaven. Not just about going to heaven when you die, but the kingdom of God and God's values and why God is a good God, and why we follow him. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now you're saying, I haven't healed the sick, I haven't cleansed the lepers, I haven't raised the dead, I haven't cast out the demons, but what you have freely received, go ahead and give that. So some of you have been healed. People have prayed for you, and you've been healed. Share that experience, and pray for others. Some of you have seen miracles in your life, then share those miracles with others and then pray for miracles in other people's lives. So give others the assurances that you have received. What Jesus says is you've seen me do this and you've been with me and I've used you to do these things. Now you do these things for other people because you have received those assurances. So first of all, think about the people God has used in your life. Not only sharing about those people, as I often have, I just shared today about my friend Javier, I shared about my mom, shared about different people in my life. Not only sharing about those people, but be that person. Maybe you are that person in someone else's life that gives someone else the assurance that God is real and that God loves them. Secondly, the experiences you have had in Christ. Share those with other people. This is what I've experienced. Peter isn't saying trust all of everything on my experience, but he shares his experience. So share your experience with other people and then share the more sure word of scripture because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you give someone the word of God and you give them a promise in scripture or a truth of scripture, there are times that it doesn't, it's like a, a, a timing mechanism And God knows the time in that person's life. And once that thing is in their heart and they think about it, there's a time in their life that they're gonna go through something. And sometimes there's that memory, just like it is in my life, where I could read something in the morning on the same day and go, huh, 
I, I, don't, I don't really get anything out of that. And then later on in the day, something happens, and that comes back to my remembrance, and I go, oh, that wasn't just for me. That was for someone else. So share God's word with other people. So as we close, we are going to have a time of communion. And a time of communion, on this first Sunday of the month, we do this collectively, and then we are uh, going to share a meal together afterwards. Uh, We have lunch for you. But it's what is known as the Lord's Supper. And I want to um, share what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church so that as we partake, this will, this will be for, for you as well. Um, if we have the worship team come up, and in a moment we're going to pass out the elements. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, um, But in following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. So I want you to hear this. He says, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there's divisions among you, and I believe it in part. This morning, there are some conditions, some ways that we need to prepare our hearts to receive communion. Um, One of those things is when Paul is writing, he's like, hey, there's divisions and factions among you. If there is some grudge, some type of thing that I am holding against someone else, then I need to ask the Lord to help me to forgive that person. Reconciliation takes two people. Forgiveness just takes one. I could forgive even those not reconciliation. So, God wants you to forgive and do your part, as it says in Romans, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Like, as much as depends on you. Maybe you say, well, I've tried. Well, then that's great. You've tried. Pray for that person. During our time of communion, how do I know if I've really forgiven someone? One of the ways that I know is I could pray for them. It's really hard to pray for someone without forgiving them. And I say, God, would you help them? Would you... um, Forgive them even as you've forgiven me. Would you help me to forgive? So we could, we could pray. Then he goes on to say, for in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal, one goes hungry, another gets drunk. He says, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? Paul writes, no, I will not. Maybe communion often is just about me. And, and it is a personal thing. Remember we talked about personal experiences. This is where I experience God. But it's not just about me. It's about others. And maybe I've been selfish, self-centered in my thinking. Uh, I'm not thinking about other people. I'm only looking. I'm not even thinking about the rest of the body of Christ. When we partake together, one of the reasons why we are going to wait to, today and, and partake at the same time is we're thinking of others as well. So pray for the body of Christ. Pray for other people. Ask God to show you where there are needs because the provision that you hold in your hand represents God's body and God's blood, Jesus' body and blood that were given for us. And in the same way, maybe God is going to prompt you during a time of communion to see a need in someone else's life that you might meet. And then he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So what we want to do is as we partake, is we have to understand what it signifies. The body and the blood of Christ. If you've never received Christ as your savior, then today could be that day where you say, Jesus, I don't know everything. I have questions, but I thank you that you've come into this world to die for my sins. You've come to experience what we as humans experience so that you could relate to us. And I put my trust in you today 
And I'm asking that you would receive me even as I receive you. If you would pray that prayer, then you're invited to partake of communion with us. And then also for us that have already become followers of Christ, this rebirth, this regeneration, we look back and we say, Jesus, thank you for what you've done. And so I'm not holding on to any private sin or even struggle or even the doubt that God loves me. Why? Because the greatest evidence of his love for you is not your circumstance today. The greatest evidence is that he came and he gave his life for you. The elements that you hold in your hands represent Jesus's love, God's love for us. So we're going to prepare our hearts. We're going to pray. We're going to sing this song. And as we do, um, the ushers will come and they'll give, uh, they'll hand out the elements. So would you pray with me? Father, today we are mindful of what Christ has done on our behalf. And Lord, we do not partake in a worthy way because we've earned it. In fact, we partake in a worthy way because we confess that we cannot earn it. And we ask that you would forgive us for our sins, that you would cleanse us, that there would be no barrier between us and you. That today, those things that maybe we're struggling with, we would be reminded of the assurance of your love. God, we thank you that we have assurances, but no greater assurance than that Christ came and died for us. So as we are praying, if you've never received Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you could pray with me and say, Jesus, thank you for coming into this world. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for dying for my sins. And I pray for your forgiveness. I ask that you would receive me even as I receive you and fill me with your spirit. Help me to follow you. And Lord, for those of us that have already received you, we've already received Christ into our lives, we pray if there's anything that we are holding on to, any grudge, any, anything of unforgiveness, that as we partake today, that you would remind us of your great forgiveness for us. So prepare our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship. As the elements are passed out, hold on to them. And at the end of the song, we are going to partake together.